try to do in this class is do a little bit of Java review because you know it's one of those things that maybe you've had a Java class, intro to Java class, and you know you don't necessarily remember everything uh, from the class. So it's kind of good to go over it, review it, um, things like that. Especially concepts that could be a little bit tricky. And so what I will try to do is as I as we run into something in our Android work, I will sort of talk about it from the Java perspective to make sure that we understand the concepts so that we don't have any questions with the Android stuff. And what I want to cover today, and so we'll take maybe 15 minutes at the beginning of the class, um, I want to talk about um, polymorphism, inheritance, subclass, superclasses, abstract classes to go uh, review them. So we're kind of, I came up with an example driving here. Um, and it's a goofy example, but it'll it'll do the trick, I think. We're going to create. Uh, we're going to talk about a, a, a little inheritance scheme where we have an abstract class as a superclass, a couple subclasses inherit from that, and then another subclass inherits from one of the subclasses. All right. So, and we'll talk about functions that exist on each of these. So, here's our inheritance scheme. At the top of the list we have an animal. Alright? This is an abstract class. We have inheriting from an animal. going to be an abstract method on animal of speak. All right. That method will be overridden for dogs. System out print ln wolf. Cats will do meow. You can see I don't have that long of a drive in to work, right? I didn't think of anything more elegant than this, right? Finally, this one I like. Alright, this is this is a punchline. The service dog overrides the method speak by outputting how may I help you. The service dog also has a method get conditions where you specify where it outputs what the service dog is, what kind of service the dog performs. Is it a seeing eye dog? Is it a comfort animal for someone that has PT, PTSD? And so on. Um, service dogs do a lot of different things and, and again they get, they get special training to do certain things. Okay, so that is our scheme. First of all, I mentioned that animal is an abstract class. What does that mean? What does that mean either in programming terms or maybe more in conceptual terms? Programming means you can instantiate it. Can instantiate it. So I cannot say this. Animal A equals new animal. Penalty flag, that's an error. 
You can't instantiate an abstract class. You can only instantiate concrete classes. So you can't have new animal, in our case, or new abstract class. On a more conceptual level, the thought is kind of like this. You know, there's nothing in the world that is simply an animal. Like, what, it's correct to say, what's that over there is an animal, but it's not just an animal. It's, it's a specific kind. You know, every real animal that exists in the world, none of them are merely animals. There's giraffes and elephants and turtles and all kinds of things, but nothing stops that animal, all right? So therefore, to have a real world one of these, you have to get more specific and implement something that's concrete. So that's an abstract class. In programming terms, you cannot do this. What does an abstract method mean? We said speak on animal was an abstract method. What does that mean? Right, there's no code for it. We simply said that anything that is a subclass of animal must have an animal, or I'm sorry, must have a speak method on it. Or at least the ones that are, at least the classes that are abstract themselves. Or they themselves must be abstract classes. Because <laughs> I could have, for example, underneath animal, I could have mammal, bird reptile, fish, amphibian. And those might not have an implementation for the speak method either. All right? But the bottom line is when you have a concrete class that inherits from this, it has to have a method, has to override that abstract method with something. If I didn't have a speak method for dog or cat, if I tried to compile something that used dog or cat, I'd get an error. All right? Am I allowed to do this? Animal A equals new dog. Am I allowed to do that? Yes. yes, I can. Okay. What happens if I say a dot speak? What do I get? Get wolf. All right. This is polymorphism. I can say this because a dog is an animal. Strictly speaking, you know, we're talking about creating objects and creating a pointer. I can put in a pointer for de that's designated for animals, I can put any of its subclasses. So I can create animal A equals new dog. All right? Could I do the reverse? Dog D equals new animal. No. No. Why not? For start, for start is up. You can just stand it. Yeah. Right off the bat, I can't because animals A class, uh, an abstract class. And then there's, if it's you know, a lot more general than simply dog, you can, it could actually be a, a cat class or something. Okay. It's entirely different branch. Okay. So, here's the idea. When we're looking at the super classes, there's only one object that's created. And which Versions of the methods that we're going to get depend on how it's instantiated. So, because I made it a dog, it's going to have, that object in memory is going to have the dog's methods. So, speak is going to say wolf. If later on I did this, A equals new can. Could I do that? Yes. Sure. Because I can store a pointer to a cat in a animal typed variable. If I then said a.speak, I'd get meow. Because 
then animal would be pointing to a cat object whose speak method would say meow. Okay. Could I say this? Dog D equals new service dog. Yes. Sure. Because again, service dog is a dog. So I can point a pointer to a service dog in a pointer of dog. If I said D dot speak, what am I going to get? How may I help you? Okay. Can I say D dot get conditions? Yes. Right. The simple answer to, to that, you're right, you can't directly do that. Right? Because if I am pointing to a dog variable, what is available? If I'm pointing to a dog object, if the compiler knows this is a dog object, all I can call on it are the, the methods that exist on the level of dog. So any methods that are on the dog, or are inherited from animal, or whatever, I have access to those methods. But I don't have access to the methods that are on service dog, if I'm referring to the superclass, if the pointer is pointing to the superclass. Now, I'll get the service dog's methods, provided there are also methods on the dog, right? The methods that exist on the dog or the animal. I can access those methods and get the right version of those methods. But anything that's declared on a subclass lower than dog, I can't access. So this would give us a compiler. So what we can do is we can cast it. That is, we can treat it like it is. We can tell the compiler, I have inside information, right? You should only cast something if you know what you're doing, in other words. Like, if I wrote this code, and don't ask me why I would write it this way, all right? But if I did, I could say service dog SD equals service dog D. What is that doing? That is saying I'm creating a variable called SD that I'm going to use to point to service dog objects. I'm saying because I know really in my code that D is pointing to a service dog, Right, because I wrote this code and I remember that this line, two lines above it, says new service dog. So because I know this points to a service dog, I can say, well, yeah, I know D's only a dog. D's only a regular dog. But because I know for sure that that's a service dog, I can cast it as a service dog. Which means I can effectively, I, I don't want to use the word convert. I'd rather use the word that it will treat it as though it's a service dog. It will recognize it as a service dog. So SD then, I could say speak, certainly. And I could say SD, I could say get conditions. Because now it's recognized that that is, in fact, a service dog. Because I made it a service dog. Now, where could this go wrong? This could go wrong if I was mistaken. If this line of code said dog D equals new dog, and I tried to cast it as a service dog, I would probably, and again, depending on exactly how it's written, maybe the compiler would notice that. If not, definitely at runtime, it would notice and say, hey, I can't make that a service dog, it's just a regular old dog. And this instruction would blow up with an exception. All right? Because if it's just a dog, I can't treat it like a service dog. I can treat a service dog like a dog, all right, and only have those methods available, 
but I can't cast something that's, I can't cast from here to here unless I know for sure that that object is one of these. Okay. Is that, is that clear? Questions on this? Why is service dog service dog? Why is it twice? Well, I'm saying I want to create a new variable called SD. That variable is of type service dog. Where am I populating that pointer from? Because remember, all these object references are pointers. I'm saying that I want this to be the object D, except treated as though it's a service dog. So I'm effective, I'm more or less, I hate to use the word, but it's like converting it to a service dog. So that's why it's there twice. This is simply declaring a variable like I could declare anywhere. Service dog SD. I could declare a variable anywhere. And this is saying, well, I can't say service, I can't say SD equals dog there, right? Because I can store a service dog in a dog pointer, but I can't serve a dog, I can't store a dog, any old dog, in a service dog unless I tell the compiler it's okay. It's okay to treat this like a service dog because I know that when dog was created, it was created as a service dog. Another way you might do it is like declare this, uh, just cast it from the D on the D.C. and not create a second variable. Would that also work? If I said... Cast in front of that, yeah. In front of that? Service dog. I don't think that would be necessary, if anything. That wouldn't be necessary because it's going to get the correct, correct oh, I method for that. But maybe for this one, yeah. if you did D, I yeah, I suppose you could do that. I think that it kind of points it. You just treat it differently. Just right. Like the, right. Is service dog those two words? Are those the same thing, or is one one thing and one another? They're, well, they're both the name of a class. I'm creating a pointer. I'm creating a pointer named SD, and it's going to point to service dog object. What I'm saying here is make this object a service dog object. I can do that because it is a service dog object. I guess I don't understand what. Do you have to use the same word service dog equals service dog? In this case, you do. There could be cases where you didn't if you had multiple layers of inheritance. You could cast something as something else. Are those two service dogs two separate things? They're both you. They're both referring to the service dog class. They both refer to the same yeah. class called yeah. service dog. This part, this part again, is just like doing a variable declaration. I have a variable named SD that is going to store pointers to service dogs. All right. I have this object D that contains. Let's try to draw this, see if that helps. All right, and let's break this down into two lines. All right, dog D equals new service dog. So what's that going to do? It's going to create a variable, an object reference pointer called D, that's going to point to a dog object. All right. New service dog means I'm going to create in the heap a new object here, which is a service dog object. And let's say it's in memory location 1,000. So D is going to contain a value of the pointer of 1,000 to point to that service dog. All right? So I call D speak. D speak will call the speak method on this object. This object's a service dog. So it will ask, how may I help you? OK. This pointer is pointing to a dog. We could put any kind of dog we wanted to 
in that pointer. We could point to it. If we had multiple subclasses, you know, a yip dog, a scary dog, however many subclasses we had, we could put any of them in that variable D that points to dog. All right? And we, when we called D speak, would get the proper method. For the yip dog, it would say yip. For the scary dog, it would say growl or whatever. But we put the service dog in there, so we got that. I'm going to create a variable called SD, which is an object reference pointer, that's going to point to service dogs. Okay? So that's all that does is that creates a pointer. After this line, it's not pointing to anything. It's a null pointer. Here I'm saying I want SD to point to D. All right? Let's say first time off, I say SD points to D. I'm going to get an error when I try to compile that. Right? Because the compiler doesn't know at this point what kind of dog D is. D could be just a plain old dog, or it could be a yip dog, or it could be a scary dog, or it could be a service dog. So the compiler won't allow this assignment. Because all the compiler knows about D is that there's a dog in there. Some kind of dog. So the compiler won't let me store a dog in a variable that's meant for service dogs. Okay? So I can't take a dog and store it in a variable that's meant for service dog. Because it might not be a service dog. All I know at this point is it's a dog or one of dog's ancestors. So this will give me a compile error. But you know what? I wrote this code. I know D is pointing to a service dog. How can I tell the compiler, hey, Nudge, here's a tip. That dog that I created in the variable D is a service dog object. Honest. I swear it is. All right? So therefore, I know this statement looks weird, but treat it like it's a service dog, because I know for sure it's a service dog. So that's what the service in parentheses says, service dog in parentheses says. It says, take this variable called D, and it's OK to treat it like a service dog, because we know it's a service dog, because we're the one that made that variable. And then I can say SD equals service dog D. So that won't give us a compiler error. It could give us a runtime error if I broke my promise, right? If this wasn't a service dog, if this said dog D equals new dog or dog D equals new yip dog or something like that, when this line of code got hit, it would say, well, wait a minute. The Java virtual machine would go, wait a minute. You promised that that was a service dog and it isn't. I'm going to blow up. And then it would blow up. But as long as you keep your promise and give it a service dog, then everything's OK. All right. How does that relate to what we looked at last time? That relates to this statement that we looked at last time in the tip calculator that we looked at. All right. This looks a lot like the statement service dog SD equals service dog D. The only difference here is instead of a service dog, it's a button. And instead of the variable D, we're calling the method find view by ID. All right. What does find view by ID do? It takes whatever ID we give it to it, and it finds the thing in the main content view that has that ID. Well, the ID is r.id.calc. 
And what on the on the, the layout has an ID of R, that is resources, ID calc, the button does. So I know, because I wrote this, all right, I gave the ID R ID calc. So I know the thing that has an ID of R ID calc is a button. But this method doesn't return a button. It returns a view. So I can't simply say button calc equals find view by ID. Because find view by ID returns a view. We can use find view by ID to return any view that's in our layout. Or I should say return a pointer to any view in our layout. We can do it to find that, that text view that's called tip. Or the spinner control that's called service. Or the edit text that's called uh, has an ID of amount. We use the same function to find any of the views that exist in our layout. And not all of them are going to be buttons. So find view by ID simply returns a generic view. All right? So this function returns a view. But you know what? We know, because we're the ones that made up the IDs, that the thing that has an ID of calc is a button. So I can promise the compiler that this is a button. All right? And therefore, it will, when it finds that view, it will know that, okay, this variable called calc, that's a button. It really is a button, and therefore we can treat it like a button. Because we can treat it like a button, I can do button things to it. All right? I can call functions on my variable calc that only exist on the button class, such as set on click listener. So... I can set on click listener for the button on the page to be this. What is this? I mean, it means this very object. The object that is the object for the main activity. I can do that because this activity implements view on click listener. That interface that I said before. And that's legal because Remember, to implement an interface, you need to implement all the methods in that interface. There's only one method, and that is on click view, public void, on click, and a view argument. So, in a nutshell, what these two statements do is that they find the, the calc button amongst all the other views that are on that layout. And it assigns to that calc button this object to handle the clicking. And specifically, the clicking is going to be handled by the on-click event of this object. Any questions on this? Is there a button.java somewhere? That... Absolutely. It, so you're saying button.java calc equals button.java find view by ID. That's okay. Um, what that's saying is I'm making a variable. This is a class type, right? And that comes from button.java somewhere. Yeah. It, we import Android widget button. Okay. All right. So there is a class in the Android framework named button. Okay. I'm creating a variable called calc that. that's going to contain a button. All right. I want it to contain the button that has the ID of calc. So, find view by ID is going to give me the view in my layout that has the ID of our ID calc. The problem is, is that this function by itself simply returns a generic view. Because later on...
the same find view by ID finds any type of view on my page. All right? But we want to treat this view, this particular view, like a button because we know it's a button. All right? We want to call the functions that exist only on a button. All right? So in order to do that, we have to tell the compiler, hey, that view that you just found, by the way, is a button. All right? Because I know it's a button. I, I want to create the layout. I defined it that way. In the uh, main XML file, hmm? it says button. If you call that button 1 or button A or whatever, would you then change that name in the Java to button A? No. Because there is no class called button A or button 1. This is the button class. All right? The way that you identify a specific button is via its ID. All right? So I didn't make up button. All right? There's a predefined class called button. All right? Okay, cool. Okay. So at this point, what we have is we have that button wired to this object. So when we click on the button, this object's going to handle it. And specifically, the onClick method is going to handle it. All right? And here's where we do the calculation. I'm going to do the exact same thing for that edit text, the result, and the spinner control. I'm going to grab pointers to all of those views on my page. Edit text E equals edit text, find view by ID, r dot id dot amount. If we look in our XML file, the edit text that has an ID of amount. So we find that guy. We know that it's an edit text field. So we cast it as it. So now E points to that text field within our layout. T points to where we want to put the answer in our layout. And finally, S points to the spinner. These are all classes in the Android framework. And they're all described in the layout, and they're all pointed to by those IDs. And find view by ID is the same function to find any view, right? There's not a special, special function that says find button, all right, by ID find edit text by ID, find spinner by ID. There's one function that finds any view by ID. And that's okay. It's going to give us back a view object. However, that view object is actually going to be a button or an edit text field or a text view or a spinner or whatever. So we have to tell the compiler to treat that view like the type of view it actually is. So this grabs the value from the edit text field. Double cost equals double, parse double, e, get text to string. So this will give us the cost from the text box, from the edit text field, I should say, in a variable called cost. I create a percentage field for percentage of tip, and I initialize it to zero. I have this line of code that really isn't needed. <laughs> I then am saying s.get selected item position. And I'm testing for 0, 1, or 2. All right? 0 means that the first item on the list was selected. That means that the service was poor. 1 means that the um, second item was selected, which means the service was average and Two means that the third item was picked, means the service was excellent. Depending on whether the service was poor, average, or excellent, I set the percentage to 10, 15, or 
Now, if we didn't cast that as a spinner, I couldn't call this method. Because, whoops, because that method doesn't exist on just ordinary views. Get selected item position. That only exists in a spinner, maybe, maybe a couple other views. But it doesn't exist in an edit text field or a button or anything like that. So I have to cast it as a spinner so I can do spinner type functions to it. I then go and do the calculation, calculate the tip as being the cost times a percentage. I then set the text associated with the results to the value of tip converted to a string. So to run this, in a nutshell, in. We set the service, calculate tip, and then we have the answer. I spent a lot of time going over these lines of code because we're going to see them all over the place. It's how we grab a reference to the things in our view. All right. It sort of creates the link up between this file that we define an XML representation of our screen and our Java code, where we're going to grab different things, we're going to do stuff with the things on the screen. We're either going to get their values, or we're going to display things in them, or whatever. So, effectively, when you do this, set content view, R layout, activity main, it's almost like you're, you, you got a, a dehydrated view, <laughs> all right, in the XML file, because the XML describes a view. This set content view sort of brings that view to life and actually creates all the objects, all right? The XML really is just a description of what objects ought to be created. When you set the content view using that layout, it takes that description that's in the XML file and actually creates all those objects. So now we have those objects the text views, the edit text, the buttons, the spinners, and so on, we have those objects actually alive on the screen of our device, and we need ways to reference those because we want to do stuff with them. And that's exactly what the find view by ID and casting it to the particular type of view that it is does for us. And again, the final thing that connects everything together is we set listeners, all right? Uh, there's different kinds of listeners depending on the, on the specific type of object and, and what you're doing and so on. The on-click listener is obviously a good one for buttons because what do you do with buttons? You click them. So when we click the button, something happens. And in this case, the something is we grab the values from those things, do a little bit of math, and then display the result. Questions about this? On the set content view, so in Android, I'm guessing that object, set content view, is expecting some sort of XML file. Exactly. Okay. It's expecting an XML file that contains a layout and views in it. We couldn't just give it any XML file. It's expecting, it's expecting a layout like this. We don't have to have exactly this, but it's expecting an XML file that has a layout, maybe a linear layout, maybe some other kind of layout. It's expecting that to contain views and so on and so forth. Absolutely. Okay, what I'd like to do is preview an application that will start this week and we'll look at it uh, next week. Uh, this is Thursday, right? <laughs> okay, uh, we do have class. Tuesday next week. I was, I was briefly was not sure if this was Monday or Wednesday or Tuesday or Thursday. I should know that, right? Because Thursday was my last day uh, at LC uh, this week. Um, so yes, we will continue this on Tuesday. And I'm going to open up.
this game of high-low. And this is like a, I wanted to do a simple game. So this is a real simple game. It was like, uh, I found it on a website like with games for kids. All right. And the way this works is like this. Let's run it. two dice and you're going to pick from three options of what you think is going to show up. Low is two through six. Seven is exactly seven. High is eight through twelve. So what do you think we're going to get on the roll of two dice? Two dice could go anywhere from two to twelve, right? It's assumed to be six-sided dice. So two uh, through twelve what do we think we're going to roll? High. Okay. I like that. Decisive. So I'm going to pick high, and I'm going to roll. And if we guess high or low, we get paid one, one to one. All right? So the assumption is, is that we're betting one chip. All right? So if I say high, if it is high, I should go from 100 to 101. If it's low or 7, I'll go down to 99. So high and low pay out one to one. Seven pays out four to one. Quick, if you're knowledgeable of probability, this is a losing game, all right? Because the, the odds of rolling a seven are uh, one out of six, and they're paying you four to one on it. So, and the odds of, getting, of it being high or low are slightly less than 50-50, and they're only paying you even money. So it's a losing game. Maybe that's, maybe that's the intent of this game, to keep, teach kids lessons, not to gamble. All right? But if I click play, oh, it's a, it's a low. So we lost. All right, I'm going to guess seven. Oh, ten. Lost again. Six. Seven again. Dang. Let's try low. I won. Yeah, so I go up one. Real simple game. Real rules. Real simple rules. All right? So let's look at what this is containing. And this is available. You can download it and view it and, and see all the things. But this involves... some drawables. We have six dice, dice, an image for one through six. They're all named D followed by the number, and that's significant. We have our layout. It's a linear layout. We have two image views for dice one and dice two. Two image views for dice one and dice two. We have a spinner control for our uh, spinner. And again, this is just like the one yesterday. It shows some of my things as the string reference. Other things, it shows the hard-coded string value. But again, it's, I actually did use a string file. There's a button to make it play. There's a text view to uh, indicate um, what? Whether we won or lost? A text view to simply show the word balance. And then finally, a text view to show the balance itself. Again, it might be a small point, but I think it's worth mentioning. Notice the word that says balance, which actually comes from the string file. I don't have any idea on that. Why not? Because I'm never going to reference that. That's, that's a field, that's a label that's going to play, uh, appear on the screen. I'm not going to do anything to it. 
I guess I could do I could do something with it. For example, if they got uh, you know close to zero, maybe I change it to red or something. But in this example, I don't have anything coded for that, so I don't need to assign an ID to it. There's I, icons for different sizes of screens. And I have my values field, which the main one is the strings. So I have the app name, action settings, play, make choice, and so on, along with my different messages. Now. One thing that's different about this is I actually brought another class into the picture. Um, and again, I, I know this is bad grammar, but I, I couldn't make a class name die, because the sing singular of dice is actually die. But that seems so harsh, all right? It could easily be confused. So I made it dice, even though, it's, even though that's a plural. Oh, this is, I guess, when I made it before. I think I deleted uh, the source code, so I had to go back and recreate it. I initialize a balance, or I create a couple variables for this, one for your balance, one for each of the two dice. This should look the same. It's going to be virtually the same in all of our applications. We're going to call the super classes on create, and then we're going to set the content view to some XML file. I grab a pointer to the button, all right, and I set the on click listener to this, which I can do because this object implements the on click listener, and that is legal to do because there's an on click method on this class. I grab a pointer to the balance. And I set the balance to the initial, the initial value, so when this is created. So it starts off giving you 100 points. All right, we'll do with this one like we did with the last one. In that the code is in the onClick event. And between now and Tuesday, if you can, Take a look at that code. Read through it. Because it does, I mean, it's really similar to um, the other code, except given that there's game logic, there's some randomization. And the other thing that's different about this is this actually uses a, an, another class to do this. Uh, sort of the first two examples that we looked at, everything was just in the uh, activity. This takes and uses a dice object. And that's good, because we could make maybe a whole suite of dice games, all right? High, low, craps, Yahtzee, whatever. And we could do it all using the same dice object for the basic functionality of the dice, all right? This is where we'll pick up next time, all right, is looking at the on-click event. All right, have a good Memorial, or not Memorial Day, wow, wrong end of summer, Labor Day weekend. Save Ferris, by the way, great shirt. I think he's gone already. Yeah. All right.